on this episode of the Heartland Pod for Friday, November 17th, 2023. A flyover from this week's top Heartland stories, including GOP senators can't stop Biden's student loan plans, Illinois legislature approves plan for small nuclear reactors, Ohio Republicans can't take a hint, Ohio Secretary of State misses personal financial disclosure deadline, Biden administration expands veterans' health care, and Democrat Dan Kildee of Michigan is retiring. I'm Sean Diller in Denver, Colorado, and we're glad to have you with us. If you're new to our shows, make sure you subscribe and leave a five-star rating wherever you listen. You can also find Heartland Pod content on YouTube and on Twitter at The Heartland Pod. All right, let's get into it. Senate Republicans fail to kill President Joe Biden's income-based student debt relief plan. Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia was the sole Democrat who joined Republicans in backing the resolution, which failed. Following the vote, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said there are millions of students, poor, working class, who will benefit from what the president has done. Republicans don't think twice about giving huge tax breaks to ultra-wealthy billionaires and large corporations, but when it comes to helping out working families with student debt relief, suddenly it's too much money, it'll raise the deficit, and we can't afford it. Give me a break. The Department of Education unveiled the Saving on a Valuable Education, or SAVE, plan hours after the Supreme Court in June struck down the Biden administration's one-time student debt cancellation that would have forgiven up to $10,000 in federal student loan debt for anyone making less than $125,000 per year. Borrowers who received Pell Grants would have been eligible for an additional $10,000 in forgiveness of federal student loans. The new income-driven repayment plan calculates payments based on a borrower's income and family size and forgives balances after a set number of years. More than 5.5 million student loan borrowers have already enrolled in the SAVE plan, according to data released by the Department of Education. Repayments on federal student loans restarted last month after a nearly three-year pause due to the coronavirus pandemic. With the SAVE plan, borrowers with undergraduate loans will pay 5% of their discretionary income rather than the 10% required under previous income repayment plans. Illinois lawmakers are ready to go nuclear. Governor J.B. Pritzker, who vetoed the previous bill, supports a new effort. On Thursday, Illinois lawmakers approved a proposal that would allow companies to develop new nuclear power generation in Illinois for the first time since 1987. House Bill 2473 does not entirely lift the 36-year-old moratorium on nuclear construction, but rather creates a regulatory structure for the construction of small modular nuclear reactors, or SMRs. The bill limits the nameplate capacity of such reactors to 300 megawatts, about one-third the size of the smallest of the six existing nuclear power plants in Illinois. It also requires the state to perform a study that will inform rules for regulating SMRs, which will be adopted by regulators at the Illinois Emergency Management Agency by January of 2026. Proponents of the measure say it's a step to make the ongoing transition away from fossil fuels more reliable for customers throughout the state, while opponents warn the unproven technology comes with safety risks and the potential for cost overruns. The bill passed with bipartisan support in the Senate, 44 to 7, and in the House it was 98 to 8. The opposition came exclusively from Democrats. Democratic Governor J.B. Pritzker said in a statement that he would sign the bill. He worked with lawmakers on the new bill after vetoing a broader measure this summer. Leadership of the Illinois AFL-CIO Umbrella Labor Organization released a statement calling the policy important for our state's economy and our clean energy future. It echoed a release from the Illinois Manufacturers Association saying that it would allow the state to continue leading in energy and manufacturing innovation. The legislation's sponsors, Republican State Senator Sue Rezin, and Democratic State Representative Lance Yednock said the bill has the potential to bolster Illinois' electric reliability as intermittent sources like wind and solar begin to make up a larger portion of the state's energy output. Senator Rezin said she's particularly interested in the potential for SMRs to be developed at the sites of former coal plants in Illinois, avoiding the need to build new transmission lines. Because permitting nuclear energy takes many years at the federal level, the earliest a nuclear project could be brought online in Illinois would be in the 2030s. But critics of the bill and of nuclear power are worried. David Kraft, an outspoken critic of nuclear energy and head of the Chicago-based advocacy group Nuclear Energy Information Service, urged lawmakers at a Thursday committee meeting to reject the bill. Kraft said he was concerned about the lack of his existing SMR installations and the unproven nature of the technology. While some nuclear reactors of this scale do exist in other countries, no commercial SMRs have ever been built in the United States. In a follow-up interview, Kraft said that SMRs bring with them security concerns as the smaller installations have different staffing requirements than traditional reactors and use a more highly enriched type of uranium. Sierra Club Illinois Chapter Director Jack Darren called nuclear energy at best a distraction. Sierra Club was one of the main advocacy organizations that sought Pritzker's veto of the previous bill. And the Sierra Club doesn't support this effort either. 
Since 2016, five other state legislatures have either repealed or weakened their bans on nuclear construction. Counting Illinois, bans on nuclear construction remain on the books in 11 states. Several of the states that have lifted their bans in recent years have done so to pave the way for SMR technology, but the biggest player in that industry has seen several upsets in recent weeks. As lawmakers debated the bill on Wednesday, New Scale Power, the only company with a federally approved SMR design, announced it was canceling its highly watched carbon-free power project in Utah, which would have been the first commercial project with a New Scale reactor. The project's cancellation comes after months of falling stock prices and criticism from training firms. Still, its leaders say the company will continue with its other projects, which are at various steps of regulation and planning. Bill sponsor Senator Rezin noted there's a lot to learn from New Scale's canceled project, but hopes Illinois and other states' moves to reverse their construction bans will encourage nuclear energy development in the U.S. She said if we don't build out this technology with companies that are in the United States, there's other companies and countries like Russia that are looking to sell that technology, and we don't want that. Ohio GOP flows 15-week abortion ban despite voters saying no. The Ohio Senate president has floated the idea of a 15-week abortion ban following voters decisively choosing to keep lawmakers out of their reproductive care. The debate over Issue 1 continues at the State House. Some fringe and alt-right Republican House representatives are infuriated with the voters who stood up to secure abortion rights in the state. Issue 1, their proposal to enshrine abortion rights, passed 57 to 43 percent on election night. Despite this large victory, State House Republicans have been mulling over ways to combat it. State Representative Jennifer Gross is seemingly leading this fight with other far-right representatives Bill Dean, Melanie Miller, and Beth Lear. The quartet is described by other Ohio Republicans as being on the extreme end of their caucus due to anti-vaccine beliefs, peddling of conspiracy theories, and attacks on the LGBTQ plus community. Describing a potential 15-week abortion ban, GOP Senate President Matt Huffman said, clearly, there's a majority of people in Ohio who want that. However, that would of course be the opposite of what the voters just said a week ago. There are no statistics backing up what Huffman says. And based on the language of issue one, the voters chose not to have any restrictions before viability. State House reporter Morgan Trow asked President Huffman, would 15 weeks be going against the will of the people? He said he didn't know. After the election where Ohioans stood up to demand abortion rights, the Senate president said that this wasn't the end and there would be a, quote, revolving door of repeal efforts. Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose misses his extended reporting deadline in the U.S. Senate race. He's the only one who hasn't filed. Three Republican candidates hoping to topple U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown go before voters in a few months. And by now, they should have disclosed information about their personal finances. Two of them, State Senator Matt Dolan and entrepreneur Bernie Bereno, have done so. But after filing an extension through November 14th, Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose still has not. In both the U.S. House and U.S. Senate, candidates and members have to regularly file disclosures that describe their financial positions, assets, and liabilities. But the reports stick to broad strokes. Filers name their mutual funds, for instance, but the amount of their holdings are bracketed. $1,000 to $15,000, or $15 to $50,000, etc. Current U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown reported about $27,000 in retirement income from his time as a state official. His U.S. Senate income doesn't need to be disclosed, nor do his U.S. Senate retirement accounts. Brown also reports serving as a trustee at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. since 2008. Under U.S. Senate rules, candidates must file financial disclosure reports within 30 days of becoming a candidate. Secretary of State LaRose announced his candidacy July 17th and filed for a financial disclosure extension August 9th. The extension gave him until November 14th to file. Despite the 90-day reprieve, LaRose has not filed. The Ohio Capital Journal reached out to his campaign to see if the report had been filed but not yet posted or if the campaign has requested a further extension, but the campaign did not respond. Late filing carries a $200 penalty and failing to file or filing a false report carries a civil penalty of up to $50,000. LaRose's failure to file thus far is particularly notable given a $250,000 personal loan he made to his campaign in September. While his Republican opponents have loaned their campaigns significantly more money, LaRose doesn't really have that kind of money. His previous disclosures from his time as a state lawmaker don't suggest he'd have that sort of cash readily available. Chagrin Falls Republican Matt Dolan comes from a wealthy family that owns the Cleveland Guardians baseball team. In addition to serving in the legislature, Dolan has worked in the Gallega County Prosecutor's Office and as an Assistant Attorney General. The state senator's investment holdings are vast, including stocks for more than 250 companies, more than 50 mutual funds, and bonds. He reports a Morgan Stanley money market account with more than a million dollars alone, as well as several mutual funds worth more than half a million dollars each. Dolan also reports a handful of retirement accounts, partial ownership of several LLCs, and real estate. One residential building 
brought in more than $50,000 in rent. In addition to his income, Dolan holds personal lines of credit with Morgan Stanley worth at least $5 million. The interest rate for that credit line is just 5.96%, according to Dolan's amended report, roughly 2.5 percentage points below the current prime rate. Dolan has loaned his campaign a total of $7 million. Next, there's Bernie Moreno. If anything, Moreno's disclosure is even more complex. The Westlake entrepreneur began his business career selling cars, and his report describes his role as director of 17 different automotive business entities, most of which are no longer operating. But from cars, Moreno has branched into several other lines of business, including real estate and tech. Moreno's assets are held in a series of trusts, and the report includes several notes about partial ownership and recent sales. He owns 65% of Driver LLC, for instance, which the report values at between $5 and $25 million. Moreno recently sold off his stake in a different company called Champ Titles and reports making more than $5 million on the deal. He has investments worth at least half a million dollars in a handful of Tel Aviv companies working technology, social media investing, and healthcare AI. Moreno has also invested in Naria, the venture capital firm U.S. Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio started before running for office. Vance has endorsed Moreno's Senate bid. Moreno also reports owning millions in residential and commercial real estate. He owns 43% of a home in Ocean Reef, Florida, worth at least $5 million. It appears the property is a rental because it generated more than $50,000 in income. Moreno also owns a 1% stake in condos located in Washington, D.C. and New York City, as well as a million-dollar unimproved parcel in Zapotal, Costa Rica, and at least a million and a half dollars sitting in two checking accounts. Moreno has loaned his campaign $3 million. Biden administration expands veterans' health care coverage. Officials said the Department of Veterans Affairs will expand health care coverage for certain groups of veterans and their families and create new programs meant to make care more accessible. The VA will make coverage of certain toxic burn pit-related conditions available sooner than anticipated. Family members of veterans who served at North Carolina's Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune from between 1953 and 1987 will be eligible to have the cost of treating Parkinson's disease covered. And all living World War II veterans will be eligible for no-cost health care, including at nursing homes. The administration also will create a new graduate medical education program to help expand health care availability for veterans in rural, tribal, and other underserved communities. And the VA will spend $5 million on an advertising campaign aimed at having more veterans sign up for services. And Representative Dan Kildee, Dean of Michigan's U.S. House delegation, won't run for re-election in 2024. The retirement leaves open a key seat made more competitive with redistricting. Kildee, who's 65, said a cancer diagnosis this year caused him to reassess his career plans. Kildee's retirement from the 8th Congressional District, including Genesee, Bay, and Saginaw counties and portions of Midland County, leaves open a seat made more competitive during the last redistricting process. The nonpartisan Cook political report with Amy Walter has moved the seat from Leans Democratic to a toss-up. A number of candidates could line up to run in 2024 from both parties. Republican Martin Blank, a surgeon, has already declared. Other Republicans who could run are last year's nominee Paul Jung, former House Speaker Tom Leonard, and State Representative Bill Schitt. On the Democratic side, Potential candidates could include former Senate Minority Leader Jim Ananick, Flint Mayor Sheldon Neely, State Senator Kristen McDonald Rivett, former State Representative Pam Ferris, and State Senator John Cherry. In a 2020 interview with the Michigan Advance, Kildee recalled having only been in Congress for a few years when news of the Flint water crisis broke. That was one of those moments where I knew why I was there. I knew exactly why I was in Congress. I had to go to bat for my hometown because they only had one member of Congress, and I had to persuade a whole bunch of people to help me out with Flint. Kildee has served as a leader in the House Democratic Caucus and has been a close ally of former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. He's the co-chair of the House Democratic Steering Committee. Pelosi told the Michigan Advance in 2020 that Kildee has proudly carried on his family's long legacy of service, becoming a tremendous champion for the people of Flint and all Michiganders as part of leadership. As a powerful member of the Ways and Means Committee, his persistent, dissatisfied leadership has delivered critical resources to strengthen and develop his community and ensure that our budget remains a reflection of our nation's values. Congressman Kildee's bold vision and expert guidance as Chief Deputy Whip has been invaluable to House Democrats as we work to advance progress that made a difference in the lives of hardworking families in Michigan and across the country. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer said through a statement that no one fights harder for his constituents than Dan Kildee. Congressman Kildee knows the Bay Region like the back of his Michigan mitten, and I am so grateful for our productive partnership. I'm grateful for our collaboration to bring progress to areas of Michigan that too many have left behind. We brought good-paying, middle-class manufacturing jobs back to Flint, worked to lower the cost of prescription drugs with President Biden, and delivered on the issues that make a real difference in people's lives. U.S. Representative Alyssa Slotkin called Kildee's retirement a huge loss for Congress, for Michigan, and for me personally. 
The center of his work is and always has been his hometown of Flint, for which he has fiercely advocated, especially in the darkest hour of the Flint water crisis. While I'm thankful I have another year to work with him and thrilled that he's moving on to his next chapter, this departure stings. United States Representative Debbie Dingell of Ann Arbor said that Kildee will be missed. His deep knowledge of many issues and his concern for others has made a difference in countless lives and his years of service have benefited our country in many ways. And we will definitely have more on the developing primary picture for this open seat in Michigan, as well as the new open seat in Virginia as Abby Spanberger runs for governor, and everything else that happens as we are now just a couple of short months from the 2024 primary season. Well, that's it for me. From Denver, I'm Sean Diller. Stories featured in today's show appeared first in the Kansas Reflector, Michigan Advance, Ohio Capital Journal, Missouri Independent, and Capital News Illinois. Thanks for listening. See you next time.